everyone, my name is Ivan Sahumbaev and I'm working in Cyclum as a research engineer. Today I'm going to talk about uh, how to process 3D data with deep learning methods. There are several things I'd like to cover today, so let's see the plan. I'll start with brief introduction of 3D data itself, uh, what devices uh, I used for data collection, and what is the difference between 2D and 3D in computer vision perspective. Then we will talk about applications based on 3D data and common neural network architectures for solving classification and segmentation problems. After that, we will briefly talk about mesh generation and how to process manifolds in non-Euclidean space. At the end of the theoretical part, I'll highlight some data sets uh, for training and common libraries which you can use in your project. The final section will be dedicated to the real project I'm currently working on, RobBudger. There are a lot of topics to cover today, so let's start. Accessing the real data is the most important thing in deep learning. Likely nowadays uh, we can see the boost uh, of 3D data technologies uh, Kinect cameras allow us to dive to the gaming and real sense and LiDARs help uh, to orient the robotic system in environment. All these cameras uh, are based uh, on capturing RGB images uh, also with depths. And if we combine RGB with depths, uh, we will generate point cloud uh, and mesh. Another area where 3D data is everything is augmented reality, but we won't talk about this today. So now let's look at how 3D data can be represented. We all get used to the, to the, to the 2D image, uh, which is basically a, a combination of RGB value for each pixel. Um, so, but in 3D world, it can have multiple representation. The first one is uh, RGB plus depths. The second one is a mesh uh, and point clouds or uh, uh, voxel grids. But during this talk, we uh, will be mostly focused on two representations, meshes and point clouds. <clears throat> now, let's briefly go through difference between 2D and 3D uh, for computer vision point of view. As I mentioned before, the regular RGB image is a dense set of points uh, with respective RGB color values. But in contrast, a 3D object is a quite sparse and contains uh, points known as vertices, edges, uh, which, uh, the, which is the lines which connect the vertices, and uh, polygons. If we take uh, vertex and edge, we can uh, form a polygon. It can be triangle or other shape. Uh, in, if you will use uh, the triangular mesh in programming, you will definitely be uh, will have something like this. So it could be class of triangular mesh, and vertices will be defined as float array, and triangles uh, will be defined as interray. The difference between triangular mesh and point cloud that the point cloud doesn't have any uh, triangles defined. So having such data, uh, we can use it for several applications. Uh, so here, this is some simplified uh, version of pipeline which you will have. So we will have 3D data as input, then geometry processing block for do the logic, and uh, you can solve um, the part segmentation problem, classification, uh, also thin understanding, um, for, with semantic segmentation, or you can have um, multiple cameras, uh, multiple views, and sometimes you want to reconstruct the full object, and the geometry processing also allow you to do uh, 3D alignment. Uh, so, and the last one is um, object deformation, and specifically non-rigid. Uh, so, now let's start with models which you can use for uh, such 3D processing. So this is a point net. Um, the core of point net is multi-layer perceptron and max pooling operation. Here we have an input which n by three uh, points, and every point is uh, processed by multi-layer perceptron separately. Then it uh, uh, repeats several times, and after that we use max pool operation to extract global feature. Processing every point separately ensures permutation invariance. Uh, 
so in simple words, so we do not care about the order of the points. The second um, important part of this network is the feature transformer block, uh, which normalizes input to the same canonical space. Uh, so in other words, um, we would like our input samples to always be uh, with the same rotation or scaling. And having this uh, property we uh, of um, property of the TNet, um, uh, we can have rigid transformation invariants. Um, the network can be used both uh, for classification when we use global feature and classification head and for segmentation when we concatenate global feature uh, with previous outputs and uh, generate the output score for segmentation. But uh, the problem with this network that uh, if we process uh, every point separately, uh, we lose the local context information, uh, which is important for meshes or point cloud, uh, because we have sparse structure. To face uh, this limitation, the successor network uh, uh, Sorry, uh, the successor network was presented uh, is a point net plus plus. In general, it shares the same the same ideas as vanilla point net, but have a main difference in, uh, in how uh, we form the input uh, points. Uh, so here we have the input, for example, n by three uh, point cloud. Then we split this input in the some local neighborhood and perform sampling from this uh, region. Then pass it to the point net and generate uh, the feature of the uh, this region. Uh, we apply this sampling and grouping several times to generate uh, the final uh, global feature. After that, uh, uh, we add some more layers for segmentation or layers for classification. But having this uh, subregion uh, sampling allow us to uh, get access to the uh, local context. So now we know how the points uh, are uh, spatially uh, represented and where they are in the all uh, point cloud. On this slide, uh, I would like to show the, the learned patterns uh, of the network. So, on the top row, there are input shapes, and during training, the network learns global descriptor, uh, which we obtain from uh, global max pooling operator. If we start uh, to remove points from uh, input points, uh, we won't be uh, making any mistake in classification if uh, a max pool uh, will still give enough enough of signal of these critical points. So here you see that uh, how many points and what points we need uh, for make uh, a good classification. Also in the bottom row you can see upper bound shape which this, this is the most dense set of uh, point cloud uh, in which Point net plus plus won't make um, a mistake. Here I would like also share uh, some semantic segmentation results. Uh, in the top row you see uh, the scene and uh, the results uh, which were produced by these networks. And as you see, um, all objects uh, are uh, segmented and uh, the results are quite promising. So now we have talked about uh, point clouds and how to perform classical uh, computer vision tasks. But since we are in the 3D, in 3D world, uh, we can do more. One example is uh, not rigid object deformation. There are two types actually of this transformation. Rigid transformation, which uh, are translation, rotation and scaling. Or we can do non-rigid when we um, change the internal structure uh, of the mesh. Uh, so apply non-rigid transformation to point cloud is quite challenging. Um, that's why we uh, want to know the connectivity uh, in the mesh, uh, the connectivity between points. Uh, so we see here you see that the filter that re uh, responds to the feature of straight cylinder wouldn't respond uh, to a to a bent one. That's why knowing these connection points and this connectivity uh, allow us to uh, analyze uh, non-rigid 
deformation easier. Uh, so here I would like to present uh, some algorithms uh, which allow you to generate mesh from point cloud. Uh, you, you, here we have input uh, point cloud and the result of uh, mesh generation. So we can use alpha shape alg algorithm, uh, triangulation or ball pivoting or poison. Uh, from, my, from my best knowledge um, the ball pivoting uh, uh, gives you the most robust result, but it depends on the uh, coefficient which you use. So, <clears throat> uh, in order to process those meshes and process uh, and analyze uh, non-rigid deformation, uh, we uh, should go to non-Euclidean space. Uh, and there are several methods which work in this space. This, this, those are spectral, spatial and uh, uh, embeddings. So during this talk uh, I'll cover uh, spectral and uh, spatial methods only. Uh, working with meshes uh, and let's start with uh, spectral domain. Uh, working uh, with meshes we have access to the connectivity information so we know uh, which vertex connects to, to, with, to what vertex and uh, but we cannot uh, describe uh, this uh, this local region yet. Uh, in 3D world uh, we have uh, a Laplace operator uh, which can do this for us. And the basic idea behind uh, Laplacian is the following. For we have uh, some local region um, and uh, with the center of xi. So if we sum up all um, sub areas and subtract um, the xi value will have uh, some kind of uh, representation of this vertex. Uh, since the mesh is discrete object, uh, we will use commonly uh, defined uh, Cartagian schema for calculation of uh, discrete Laplacian. Also, uh, using Cartagian uh, discretization uh, allows us to have um, eigenvalues uh, which are positive and eigenvectors which are orthogonal. Okay, so uh, in the uh, matrix form uh, we can write uh, Laplacian uh, in, in this way uh, where lambda uh, is eigen, uh, lambda represents eigenvalues and phi its eigenvectors. Um, but uh, why do we need, why do we care about eigenvectors and eigenvalues? The answer is that uh, we are in non-Euclidean domain where object decomposition to simple elements uh, might be very useful. Since uh, non-Euclidean world is quite complex, um, let's see, let's check what Laplace is in Euclidean space where we uh, can do uh, better than in non-Euclidean. So it turns out that this is a standard Fourier basis, and we know how to deal how to deal with it. In, <clears throat> how to deal with it in standard Fourier transform? Uh, the complex signals can be uh, can be represented uh, as um, cosines and sines, uh, and so having uh, this idea that every signal has a uh, sine component at different um, frequencies, uh, we can uh, use this for manifolds. Uh, and for example, we can decompose uh, uh, this cat object in a multiple uh, uh, vectors uh, where alpha uh, is eigenvalue and phi is eigenvector, and uh, we can treat uh, Eigen, uh, eigenvector as uh, basis function like cosines and sines in Fourier basis and alpha uh, as um, frequency. Uh, so another thing uh, which we know very well is the convolution operator. Now let's see uh, where uh, we can use uh, this decomposition of Fourier for defining a, convol a convolution. Uh, from classical signal processing we know that convolution, uh, convolution is shift invariant and also from convolution theorem we know that uh, Fourier diagonalizes the convolution meaning that uh, uh, in Fourier domain and the convolution is 
uh, element wise product between signal and the filter which is uh, and the filter is uh, already in uh, spectral domain since Fourier, since Fourier transformation uh, is everywhere in your mobile phones uh, we can in mobile phones in signal classical signal processing we know how efficiently uh, compute it it looks now uh, that we have everything for defining convolution in spectral domain. Uh, first of all, we compute eigen decomposition of signal uh, and sp spectral filter. Then we multiply by basis function, apply inverse transform, a Fourier transform, and we have the convolution. So if we write this in um, uh, matrix form, uh, we have this equation where we replace uh, eigen decomposition uh, a Fourier trans sorry Fourier transform of uh, filter with diagonal matrix which is not shift invariant uh, so having these matrix here we assure that uh, our our convolution is strongly uh, and uh, depend on Fourier of uh, filter coefficients so uh, for every mesh uh, we have different um, a set of basis function. Uh, in comparison uh, with uh, standard Fourier basis, it's always cosine in science. Here we have completely different basis depending on shape. <coughs> in, in this slide, uh, I would like to show you example uh, how these uh, basi uh, basis uh, work. Uh, so here we have a mesh which can be decomposed with alpha and uh, phi which are eigenvectors uh, so if we sum up we'll have the full shape of this cat uh, but uh, for example if we have another shape which semantically looks like um, this, this one the, the, this, this cat uh, we see that the basis function is completely different and we want to uh, process them to treat them as similar objects and uh, in order to do this we need to uh, synchronize our coefficients so let's see how we can do this for example we have this function defined in this object and the same function defined on that object so we can uh, say that there is a linear operator, operator t uh, which um, uh, correspond, uh, which have corris correspondence of, of these uh, two functions. So also, uh, when we want to know uh, how to decompose this object on uh, synchronized base, we first um, decode, uh, sorry, encode uh, the Fourier uh, decomposition of first uh, shape with matrix C and using this matrix C of the first shape we uh, synthesize uh, the, uh, the composition of the second one. I'll show you an example here. So for example we have um, another shape here one and the second one is here and we have such um, spectral filter we want to apply. If we apply this filter in um, own basis of first shape A and B, we'll see that results are different. For example, this dot have blue, uh, blue region and here is white and red. However, if we define some, some canonical shape uh, which has own uh, basis um, C and apply filters uh, first on this canonical, uh, canonical shape and project it back to the uh, original shape, we'll see that the results are quite similar. <coughs> uh, so, on this slide, uh, I would like uh, to show correspondence results. Uh, the task is for uh, two shapes, find the similar points, the correspondence points. And by using these functional, functional maps, uh, we can uh, calculate uh, quite easily uh, what the correspondences are. Uh, so, now we know how to apply uh, spectral convolution, uh, but it is, uh, it is all, all also possible to um, define um, spatial convolution, which we often use in um, standard convolutional neural networks. So, the next couple of slides will be dedicated to the methods um, of uh, spatial domain. 
So now let's recap a bit um, uh, of convolution. Here you can see the difference between Euclidean and non-Euclidean way to apply filters. In the first one, we see the moving. Uh, if we move the kernel to the right, we will always have the same operator to extract the points uh, to which we apply convolution. But in the non-Euclidean space, so which are graphs. Uh, uh, meshes, manifolds, uh, uh, it doesn't work like this. Because if we uh, change position of the kernel, uh, the extraction operator will be different. The number of points uh, which we extract will be different. So, likely, uh, we work with meshes and we have uh, defined structure. So, we uh, can try to define um, this uh, extraction operator for let's assume that we have a local system of coordinates u i j uh, so we have the vertex i uh, and the, the connection to j so uh, which j is the the, the local uh, neighbor so we can see this uh, this system as geodesic polar uh, coordinates where every uh, value of this um, coordinate system is uh, distance uh, which with um, a respective uh, angular value. Uh, so, uh, to utilize um, uh, this network, uh, the, 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 the system we can uh, generate a set of local weights uh, which can look like this. Uh, and, and we define uh, these weights uh, as Gaussian. Um, uh, for example, uh, we have this point and uh, we have the distance, uh, geodesic distance to this uh, set of um, weights, this and, and this, and apply this patch operator. Uh, we can calculate the convolution. So, also, there are several types of these um, patches. They can look like this uh, if we have the uh, orientation. This is anisotropic uh, Gaussian or also uh, something like this when, this is, when the convolution transforms to Gaussian mixture model. So, here uh, you can see the uh, geodesic convolutional uh, layer uh, for, for the input mesh. A set of rotation patch filters are applied and then the maximum uh, is taken. So this maximum is also known as uh, angular max pooling and so uh, we see what is the orientation um, is uh, much uh, more uh, defined is this mesh. So, in general, uh, such geodesic CNN uh, can look like this. Uh, this is Siamese network when we have um, X and input and Y and we share in the weights data. Uh, the network generates the global descriptor F uh, for every uh, sample. And here you see the X point X, uh, which uh, is uh, point and uh, the positive pair xi plus uh, and during training the model will produce pointwise features uh, and minimize the metric loss uh, which looks like here so in general this loss uh, try to push simple uh, similar uh, similar object um, close to each other and uh, the points which are far or not similar far away uh, here I would like to show you and the visualization of known descriptor uh, by these networks with different patches. For example, geodesic CNN uh, learns uh, this kind of descriptor which can change, it's not uh, really stable. Um, with anisotropic CNN we have a bit more better results uh, and the monad which has the most complex patch uh, generates the best uh, local descriptor for uh, these shapes. So, uh, also, uh, I would like to uh, show you the results uh, and comparison how the network can surpass um, the random forest uh, uh, wavelet um, decomposition of the shapes. And uh, here we have uh, results of geodesic CNN, uh, anisotropic CNN, and MONET, um, which is uh, 
Gaussian mixture uh, patch and we have that uh, the geodesic error is almost zero. And so uh, when we, we define these um, uh, models, uh, we can uh, use um, those data sets for, for training. Uh, I will select, I, I did select several of them. This is the model net, uh, part net, uh, ABC net, a, a, ABC data set, and because they uh, connect uh, um, the shapes uh, from furniture, and you can use this both for part segmentation, classification, or uh, if you want to analyze CAD models, uh, ABC data set is for you. And the MPI Faust data sets. Uh, allows you to uh, train models for correspondences and uh, the position and, and the post estimation, so a quite um, good data set. Uh, so, also I would like to mention some libraries uh, which could be good starting point for 3D data processing. I'll select two languages, um, that is Python and C++. Uh, for Python, uh, I use um, Open Open3D, PyTorch3D, uh, and uh, NVIDIA Kaolin, PyTorch Points, and PyTorch Geometrics for defining the model and training utils. So, with Python, we have easy installation with PIP, contain um, visualizers, we can compute some descriptors and um, algorithms. But in, on the other hand, we have C language. Um, which has several good libraries and good community, which Leap Igel, Seagull, uh, Point Cloud Library, uh, Geometry Central, Open 3D. Um, I use uh, Leap Igel because uh, it has a lot of tutorials and quite easy uh, to implement uh, descriptor search. Uh, normal, normal estimation. If you're not f really familiar with C++, it's quite easy um, to go with uh, tutorial and do and do the stuff uh, so but C++ need to be compiled so you, you have to be prepared uh, so now I would like uh, to talk uh, about a project I'm currently working on uh, this is uh, this is a robot term. project is a Euro European funded horizon 200 2020 innovation project uh, that aims to develop uh, a robotic system which will be able to understand and plan cutting trajectories based on the carcass of the pig uh, that is presented. We have the cell, uh, we have the robot, and we have to estimate these trajectories and how to cut. Uh, one task of the project is to perform matching between real pig and synthetically modeled. And next slides, uh, uh, I will uh, describe how we do and what is the progress. Um, first of all, we start with um, this pipeline. We have data collection, but then we want to mm, perform uh, point, seg point, of, uh, point cloud segmentation, uh, then point cloud morphing and extraction uh, correspondences. Uh, so let's start with data collection. Uh, we use real sense cameras and um, based uh, on, on this data we can generate a point cloud. Uh, then we trained uh, a point net plus plus as segmentation network uh, and here you see the results which we have. We have a pig um, which is in Kaga's holding unit. Then we run the segmentation and we have clearly defined pig and, and the Kaga's holding unit. In the future you can uh, replace uh, this network uh, with other but uh, PointNet++ is quite easy to train and get, gives us a quite promising result. Uh, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we cannot calculate uh, very good correspondences between uh, point clouds. That's why uh, we have to generate mesh from the point cloud. But it turns out in the real data uh, we have this uh, a non-manifold structure at all. So we have this uh, empty space, so uh, algorithms like ball pivot and even triangu triangulation doesn't work really really well. And that's why we um, uh, apply some morphing algorithm which uh, takes as input point cloud and the piece of um, synthetic data and it generates the 
manifold mesh uh, for the input point cloud. The, the next step for our research is to generate a correspondence based on spectral analysis uh, or uh, spatial uh, non-Euclidean uh, convolution neural network. In this project we have um, several partners like uh, Buddha University, NMBU, Animalia, Byte Motion, uh, Robert Norge. Uh, so uh, it's quite hard to implement everything but we're working and I hopefully uh, um, will finish this uh, soon and everything will be uh, okay. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Hopefully you'll find something interesting for you. Uh, and if you have any question, please ask. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, it was really interesting and uh, complex. I feel like I need to get into this topic more because uh, I saw big amount of uh, unfamiliar topics for me and uh, we have uh, a couple of so, uh, do you ready to answer them? Sure, sure, let's go. Nice. So, uh, from my experience, when we work with, uh, for example, images, image classification, image segmentation, uh, we do a thing called uh, data augmentation. So, we uh, resize images, we mirror them, we change uh, colors and uh, so on to make our model more robust and uh, to prevent uh, overfitting. Do you do this uh, thing uh, when you train 3D models? For sure, you can do everything what you do for um, images, but it depends what task you're trying to solve. If it's just a segmentation or classification, regular augmentation will work as well, but you just need to consider, consider how to uh, rotate the shape or maybe subsemble uh, which technique to use. But if you use uh, uh, 3D models for non-rigid transformation, uh, it's more tricky. Probably you will need to, uh, some additional data uh, because you need to change the isometry of the shape. Okay, thank you. And we have a second question. Yeah, I think so. So uh, you, you also mentioned the real sense camera to collect the data, right? Like. And I'm just wondering, like, what are what are the other sources of the 3D information usually? Like uh, some ladder, I guess, radar, maybe something else. Uh, in general, yes. So uh, we use Kinect, uh, sorry, Real Sense camera because it gives us a good field of view. But you can use Kinect cameras, lidars as well. But uh, mostly it depends on your task. So and where you want to place this camera so if it's like automobile probably you want lighter if it's something what's move in the environment you need lighter if it's more static uh, probably you will go with real sense or connect it depends what uh, it yeah. strongly depends on the task right on. and maybe you missed this point a bit but generally uh, what kind of tasks um does the industry is like is industry trying to solve now you know like what is it like important task for the industry in terms of like this you know 3d shape recognition or like you know point cloud classification or other stuff can you just please elaborate on that on this a bit sure sure i didn't talk about uh, point clouds in industry because i didn't work much with this data but uh, surely you will use point clouds uh, for automotive problems when you perceive the world less as point clouds for example in, in the uh, in the car you can have the lighter and it can be, can give you additional information it's a depth channel or something like that uh, I guess uh, it would be also good for the robots when you try to navigate in environment so you will get also the depths and you can build the map of the environment and it can give you much more precise um, estimate of the environment in comparison with uh, just regular two yeah. images. Yeah, right on. and talking about maybe some IoT uh, devices, I don't know. Do you think that something which might be helpful to apply to the to them? You know, I don't know. Like, do you do you know any uh, applications of IoT with like gathering three D data, for example? Uh, for now, like the 3D data, uh, it's not 
completely it's not oftenly used i cannot like say what exactly in iot you can use but the most uh, what i believe the data is for users for robots so you can uh, generate any system which connects uh, any other devices and uh, you can strongly use 3d data for the robots i, I think yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think I have one more question. So, when you uh, train your model for one type of device for some camera or some lighter, uh, do you need to retrain this model for some other device? So, uh, do your models overfit on some special type of device, on some special manufacturer of, of device? No, it doesn't actually depends on the device, it depends on the data. So in both cases, so that, uh, any device will produce you a point cloud. So uh, in, in general, it's always points which has uh, coordinates or maybe you can add the RGB value for the, to the vertex. But in general, it doesn't matter which camera do you use. Uh, since you have good uh, point cloud, you're ready to go with your model. Thank you. And uh, I, I see that we have a question in our Telegram chat. So um, I will read it. Could probabilistic point clouds used? A directly made mesh could contain significant mistakes. Uh, so yes, if you generate probabilistically the mesh, it can have, uh, it, it might have um, many issues. The problem with mass generation, I assume with like the question relates to the point cloud. So when you generate a mesh from the point cloud, this is uh, still open question. Uh, I have a number of techniques and algorithms which can generate you, but the problem is that the, the point cloud structured points, uh, just unstructured set, and you don't know how to connect these points. You can approximate it. Some algorithms give you better results, some not. But in, in general, um, this is still open question. There are some models like a neural network which can generate the uh, representations uh, from point cloud to meshes, um, but uh, you should expect uh, issues in, in reconstruction or like mesh generation. Definitely you all should. All right. All right, yes, I think we don't have any other any, questions, yeah, right? Any other questions? So thank you for your talk it was fascinating and uh, we have a short uh, break and uh, after this break okay uh, we, we got we another question looks great. like yes we have another question so uh yeah thank you alexa for the question so ivan are there any solutions for using sequential frames from a single camera for 3d reconstruction uh, <coughs> you mean you you can use it Definitely, the more data you have, but you should uh, think about data uh, camera camera calibration. So every time you will receive a new frame, uh, you will add some amount of noise. But in in general, uh, you can use it uh, frame by frame. So more data you stack, sometimes it helps, sometimes not. But it depends on on the camera and on the quality of the point cloud which you generate. Yeah. You have a lot of noise, so it won't work very good. Great. Uh, I can see Alexis type another message in the chat. Maybe yeah. we can give him, I don't know, kind of 30 seconds and uh, proceed. Yeah, we have enough time on our schedule for more questions, so we can wait for more questions. Totally. And we have it. So, uh, are frozen uh, code pieces going to be processed by Robacher? Sorry, I didn't hear it. Can you repeat? Because uh, yeah, so it, like again, the question is: Are frozen corpuses going to be processed by Robacher? Like, I guess, like whether we have some frozen corpus which is not moving, uh, can we process it with Robacher or something? Uh, <clears throat> sure, I, I think it's not a problem. Yeah, you can do this. Since you have the camera which capturing the peak in the from Basher case, so you can do this. <laughs> but for Basher, it's, 
a complicated project. So and, and the, the mesh is just uh, so the, the peak sh should be frozen. Uh, no, no, it, it's working with uh, like room temperature peak. <laughs> But if you like make it cooler, uh, it, it doesn't really change anything because the, the camera uh, not affecting the uh, the temperature. It's like just depth estimation, so object can be cool or warm. It doesn't matter. Okay. And uh, one more question from the same listener: uh, Should the corpus of a peak to be frozen? This was just the answer. I just yeah, yeah, answered. exactly. So yeah. Ivan has just answered uh, this question. Yes, 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 totally. Yeah, I can see Alexis' uh, flexibility of the corpus. Yeah, so that's what I, I, I meant. Like, should the corpus be stable, like fixed or flexible? I guess. Uh, so, if it's relating to the robot, we have a cell. Uh, which like metallic cell and we definitely we fix the peak it's not floating in the space so it's it has like some points where we it's like fixed it. and then we estimate um, the position and how we can match in the case in the synthetic peak so probably you can do this if it's moving but it uh, I, I highly not sure that it will it will work in real time so i'm sure that the speed of the estimation might be not so small fast so it's not be fast we're out of questions yes i believe we don't have any more questions uh, so uh, as i said you. thank yeah. you thank you for it was your talk. very cool talk yeah 